hello again. Thank you. We have a whole stack of books. And I just want to um, call your attention to the fact that we have these books over on that shelf over there. So at the end of the day, feel free to go over there and grab one. All right. Welcome, my friend, Jen Lim. Thank you. Am I far enough away from you? Is this a six foot thing? I think we're good. We're good. <laughs> All right. So let me just start with uh, who in this room has heard of Delivering Happiness? Oh, sweet. Most people. For, for a few people in the room who haven't, why don't we go back and talk a little bit about the beginning of the journey? Sure. When the whole concept began. Yeah. Goes well, a little bit way back, actually, when we first met. Um, uh, it was 2010. And so basically, I was a consultant at Zappos for several years. And then um, Tony Shea uh, asked if I wanted to work on this book called Delivering Happiness. I said, sure, why not? I thought it was a project. Check it off some things, with this, uh, things to do. But lo and behold, um, the book did pretty well. And so we decided to create a company around it. And so pretty much since then, we've been helping companies, governments, hospitals, basically organizations around the world now. And it's been since day one, which has been really fascinating. Because at first, when we launched the book, people were like, oh, that's great, so novel, cute, you know, happiness. That'll only work at Zappos. But then I guess I felt like it was a challenge for me because I did really believe in the principles of universality of happiness. And when I talk about happiness, it's the science of it. So positive psychology, concepts and data and research has been done over the years, um, starting with you know Marty Seligman and all the way from Aristotle uh, back in the day. So that's been the last 11 years, we've been helping, helping organizations with their culture, making sure we're coupling people with profits and purpose and seeing the results. And so, yeah, that's where we are today. And um, just so people understand, who, what types of companies have you worked with over the years? It's been so interesting because you would think by now we'd see some trends, but it's just, it spans all industries, it spans all geographies, from startups to Starbucks, uh, government of Dubai, uh, Northwell Health, which is a huge hospital system in New York. So, um, yeah, construction, you know, just it, the whole nine yards. It's been fascinating because I think it's less about those other criteria. It's more about where the leaders are and how they really want to take it, how they want to take that concept and whether or not they want to apply it in a sincere way. Because it's not just checking off the box of culture anymore. I think people can really tell, employees can really tell if you're walking the talk. And so now it's when the leaders actually do some deep reflection and hold the mirror to themselves and decide whether or not it's something that they want to choose to make people a priority, but also an investment instead of this line item that's always like an expense. And so we've seen time and time again, when you treat them like an investment, they invest back in you, you know, with their blood, sweat, tears, and hopefully smiles. But, um, but yeah, it just makes sense for the company from a cost perspective, but just also you're a kinder human being <laughs> in life and society. So the, the book rolls out, the company forms, uh, you're rocking and rolling. Literally, if you follow Jen, she is traveling the world, meeting with clients, speaking, um, helping companies put these ideas into practice. So then what's the impetus for the new book? Yeah, um, that, I mean, everyone's had a crazy last couple of years, so I'm not going to pretend that mine was crazier than most, but I was supposed to write this book. Um, the contract was signed 2020 in January. Had the outline all ready and pretty and ready to go, talking about all the stats and stories of what we heard and listened and, and learned over the years with the signs of happiness in, in organizations. Then, of course, you know, 2020 hit. And then all of a sudden, every time you saw a headline, from you know, pandemic to recession to global social unrest. It, it just, the book wasn't, I guess it didn't feel big enough anymore. Like the context wasn't there. Um, and then of course, um, everyone had, a, had loss in, in these last couple of years in different forms, whether it's a person or um, you know, company or expectation or hope. Uh, and my loss, my biggest one was uh, Tony passing away. So, 
that brought me to a whole nother place. And I had to, this what it wasn't even called Beyond Happiness at that time. There was no title. And I really had to dig into myself and ask myself, am I really a true believer of this stuff? Is it truly about happiness and sustainable happiness or is there more? And that's when I came to Beyond Happiness because I really, I mean, it was a per pretty dark time uh, for a lot of people. And for me, I really wanted to explore the gamut of, yeah, is, does happiness matter? Yeah, of course. Everyone wants to be happy, meaningfully happy, you know, purposefully happy. But there's more to that in understanding what it takes to get there. And that includes not just the highs, but the lows. Uh, it includes, you know, knowing your strengths, but also your shadow sides and your blind spots. And not just professionally either, you know, like as a human being. And so that's what I wanted to explore deeply, more deeply and beyond happiness and really just open the conversation. Because so many people I talk to now, they, they're not even sure what happiness means for them um, or their family, you know, and, and and let alone your own company and your culture and what you want to create and what you want to build. And so all these questions are great, I think, because we knew something was coming. We just didn't know it was all going to come in one year, and now two years. But, you know, with the great resignation, everyone's kind of worried about that. But I think this is a great thing um, because it drives us to be more creative about what we need to do in this, you know, forever new abnorm. So great resignation on one side, but it's also a great awakening. I think for all of us, and then as, I think as leaders have this huge opportunity to create what it really means to uh, thrive and grow and adapt in the future of work, which is happening right now, <laughs> all of a sudden. So. so there are so many directions I want to take this, but um, let's start with since you were talking about 2020 uh, and you had clients at the time, um, how did the climate, the pandemic change, and how did companies, the, in, your, uh, in your estimation, some of the best companies, how to, have they reacted in, in this sort of shift uh, in dealing with you know, their, their teams, with trying to uh, maintain what maybe they had put a stake in saying, we, we are about happiness, and all of a sudden they're facing all kinds of new challenges. Um, what kinds of things did you, did you witness or were you able to be part of? Yeah, it was such an intriguing time because I really believe that, you know, in the worst of situations or events, a character, a true character shows up of a person, and the same applies for the company. So how did they react in this time when it was chaos and, you know, revenue was hemorrhaging, things like that, was super intriguing because it really went back into the psyche of the leaders and leadership. So I saw companies um, really live up to their values. I mean, like they actually said, you know what? We want to make sure we're living by our purpose and our mission. Like one company, um, well, uh, you might have heard it, it's a little coffee shop in, in Seattle. <laughs> I was so intrigued by this case study because we were working, and this was right before 2020, and it was like, we're going to plan the next 50 years of their vision. And it was like this huge endeavor because Howard Schultz is out the door and there's new leadership in town. So we were just so excited. And of course, um, you know, that Mike Tyson uh, quote, Everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. So we all got punched in the mouth. All that visioning stuff went out the door. It was totally triage. You know, they were hemorrhaging everywhere around the world. And it was amazing to see what the leadership do, did. And because, um, and you can imagine, you know, all the politics and all that stuff in a company as big as Starbucks, they actually looked at themselves in the mirror and they said, no, we, we're not actually not living our mission. And that's so big for a company that's been known to be a purpose-driven company for so long, but they actually admit it, like, we're not doing enough. We're taking more than we're giving. So that was just, you know, one example of someone that, a, a huge company that really took upon themselves to be a true leader in an authentic way. Um, another organization we worked with that I love telling about because of, you know, everyone had a hard time, but hospital systems, you can just imagine what they were going through. So this is Northwell. I think they're up to like 85,000 employees in um, upstate New York. And luckily for them, like they worked on culture before. So they got, they actually aligned their whole organization, like 300 executives. I mean, who has 300 executives? But apparently hospital systems do. Um, so we aligned them first on what their values are. So they, they came to a culture of care, which is an acronym. And then we rolled it out 
across all the, I think it was like 50 or so centers, 85,000 employees. So this was a few years before 2020. And then it hit. And I just had a, a panel with the chief experience officer, and he was sharing all these harrowing stories. I mean, can you imagine? Like, it was basically, he described it like it was a war zone. And these people, their employees are in the war zone every day. Can you imagine that psychological state? And they actually had a, um, there's a really cool documentary that just came out about what they went through, I think it's called uh, First Wave. Oh, you saw it. Um, but, um, but anyway, so if you can imagine how intense that was. And here's a company that was already on the best places to work list, the fortunes. They're like 90 something, 90 something. And then during this course of time, they actually went up and they're at 17 across all industries, not just hospitals. So that was just shocking to me. And he was just saying, very simply, it was the culture. It was because we planned ahead and embedded those values so that everyone was living by them, like authentically, and they were being rewarded and recognized for it. And that really helped him through, you know, that was one of the toughest times. Like uh, the CEO was actually, um, at the very beginning, he was told, don't walk around. Like, we don't know. Don't walk around the halls. We don't know what's going to happen. We, you know, this thing is just too unknown. Because it's too dangerous. Yeah. And here he is walking around the halls, you know, in the trenches, side by side. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure I was supposed to share that story because I don't think his wife knew that. But, I mean, he's alive and well, but it was just an indicator of what we can do as leaders to demonstrate in the toughest of times of when we do actually want to prioritize people. So I, I want to um, bring it over to talk about startups. But before we do, I'd love to talk a little bit about the science. Because in the book you talk about, this is, you know, when you were digging deep, you were bringing it back to, like, what's the science behind this? Can you talk just a little bit about that? Because I'm sure there's those in the room who, again, are thinking, yeah, you know, happiness and work and you know, a CEO walking around the room is one thing, but what, what is this really about and how do we start to, how does it really impact people? Yeah, so that's why we were very big on the science part from the very beginning because there is bound to be naysayers in every company. Every organization would be like, and no offense to finance people, but you know, they don't see the numbers in it. But because we base it on science and then we're able to show how the data actually, when you, you know, invest, in, in your people, you'll have better retention, you have better engagement and productivity. I mean, it all shows if you want to choose, you just have to show the metrics and then there will be no naysayers anymore. But going back to the science, that's why we really wanted to ground it in that. So there's been like decades of research being done on this already, which was fascinating. And we stumbled upon it like in the, I guess, in the early 2000s, so in the early days of Zappos. And it was so interesting because across all the body of uh, research, there were a few levers that actually increases your sustainable happiness for an individual. And then coincidentally, we found out for businesses too. So those levers are a sense of control, uh, senses of uh, progress. So you're growing, developing, learning, uh, connectedness. That's really simple and a really important one now. And ultimately, the most sustainable form of happiness is higher purpose and being able to instill it and live it in a, an authentic way. So imagine that you're, if you're aligning that with the individuals, everyone in your company, and that of your company's purpose and values, that's when the magic shines. And, and then it's so interesting to put it, you know, fast forward to today, how those levers showed up in a different way. Because all of a sudden, it was about control and autonomy, because we didn't have a feeling of control. Like, you know, every day, every time we open up our news feed, we were like, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. So that sense of control is so important to instill, even though we, you know, the chaos around it, we had to instill it in the employees around us. And then, of course, the connectedness thing. The lever, that one came up really high, too, because, you know, um, Zoom land for everyone wasn't all that connecting or, or great at connecting people, but we had to adapt and figure ways to get around that, too. So let's let's bring it all to startups because... It's, it's sort of easy to think about a corporation um, having a department, right? Like, okay, they've got departments that focus on marketing and HR, and so there's groups that focus on, you know, employee satisfaction and happiness. But when you're a startup and you're like, you know, maybe five people, 10 people, maybe even 20 or 30 people, maybe you're starting to scale, um, you know, the, the concerns you have as a startup can be very different, right? You're like, how do I make payroll? How do I find product market fit? How do I find a developer? How do I, you know, there's so many things 
that impact your just your ability to keep the company alive, right? So how do you even start sort of step back and think about the satisfaction and happiness of the team and how you can start to instill these things and, and why is it important at that level? You know, is it something in your experience, is it something where founders typically reach a certain point and then they need to instill it? Or is it something that you find uh, certain types of startups just intrinsically do from the beginning? Love the question. Um, actually, we were just in the green room and Zen asked, uh, when does you know happiness exist for startups? And I said, it doesn't. But, uh, <laughs> but seriously, though, what we've learned consistently, because you know, when Zappos was a startup and then when DH was a startup in 2010, um, the biggest lesson that I learned from Zappos was that we started culture too late. And I know it's so difficult because you've got, you know, enteen things to, on your mind, but um, it just went to show, like, when you start from ground zero instilling what you want your culture to be, it'll change, it'll adapt, it'll modify, it's okay. But it helps you, you know, it helps you ground yourself in terms of when you get lost in the 10 million things you got to do in the course of a day, going back to your uh, higher purpose, going back to your values will always save you and also help you because that's when you have a better sense of who's coming in, who's aligned, who's not aligned. Um, we just had a quick conversation with Brett. Blake. Blake, yeah. Um, and he's coming out after. And he said he how he started from ground zero. Now they're a $3 billion company. But the point that was awesome that he made, so it was not just Zappos or DH that started from the very beginning. Other companies are proving that when you instill it and take the time, it pays off in dividends. And it's more important to think about it from that slightly short to mid to longer term view as that investment that will be worth it in the end, even though it's gonna be, it seems hard and not enough time to, in the day to, to get to culture to people. But if you think about it the other way, that's your like primary investment, especially when times are tough at the very beginning, then it's more than worth it. So, um... So earlier, some of you may have heard uh, the interview this morning with Brian Murphy from CEO and founder of ReliaQuest, and then with Rami Assad, uh, CEO and founder of, of Distill Networks, and then Finmark. And with both of them, we were talking about uh, how do you sort of stay mentally fit, right? I'm a, anytime you talk to me, this is, this is something that's really important to me because I feel like entrepreneurs, it's a lonely path, even if you have partners. There are times that you feel like you're the only one in the world facing these hard decisions. You know, I think Brian said, you know, when you're, you're in a tough time and all of a sudden you're, you're refinancing your house or you're digging into your personal savings or draining your 401k just to try to figure out how to make payroll. Those are tough things and they, they're, they create all kinds of feelings, of shame and all kinds of things. Um, and so we were talking about how do you, when you're in those dark days, how do you keep you know, keep your chin up. And so I want to talk about how does all of this roll back to, you know, a founder or a founding team as they're embarking on this journey? How can they take some of these lessons from beyond happiness, delivering happiness and apply it to not only their company, but because like you said, their company is really a reflection mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think there's two main components of that. Um, and firstly, I mean, I think what I've, I can speak from my own experience too in terms of being in dark days and I can also speak to a lot of our clients that went through really bad times, especially in the last couple of years. But what I know after going through that and um, having that, having taken the time and doing the hard, easy work of working on myself and working on like, what is it that really is truly my purpose? What is truly what I, what, why am I doing what I'm doing every day? And making those minutes matter. And everyone had that ability to reflect over these last couple of years, especially with this great awareness. So I think in those dark moments, those are the things that kind of pull you out. And it's also a recognition that it's okay. And this whole thing about psychological safety, we hear more and more about. I think, I think this is actually more, in this current age state right now, more important than happiness to be talking about it because I couldn't even say happiness to, for a good two years. It's still hard to say for some clients or some people. But building that 
environment where you can provide psychological safety, not only for yourself, but for everyone. Time and time again, we've seen the results. And granted, Google's not a startup, but they run, they run like a startup. And so they did a really fascinating study called the Aristotle um, Project. And so what they wanted to understand was how, what are the most effective teams? So essentially startups within the company, which ones, like what made them so effective? And it wasn't like, you know, tools, it wasn't project management stuff, it wasn't anything but psychological safety. And so I think in this current age and time, to be able to embrace that within yourself, how do you do it? I mean, I'm a big proponent of, uh, you know, expert help. If you want to talk to therapists, I mean, it's like, thank you, Simone Biles. Like, it's not a nasty word to say mental health anymore on, you know, it just, it just so happened to... Um, her workplace is on an international stage, but you know, this is all our workplaces and this is our time to say yes and no too. So getting help that way has been helpful. And I also, I'm pretty transparent in my book. I talked to CEOs and leaders and they got into plant-based medicine. So basically, you know, did some shrooming and acid tripping and, you know, under controlled conditions, but in a way that was for intentional, you know, intentionally used, not recreational. So not to say I'm advocating that, but, you know, it works. Um, I'm not against it either. <laughs> but, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think what, and then kind of going back to when you go through that work and understanding your purpose, then, and your, yourself, again, your highs and your lows, then it becomes at least a little clearer as to what you need, because only you know that. Only you know when you're being an authentic self in your highs and lows. And when you do that deep, you know, deep dive and hard work, then you'll know how to pull yourself up, let alone the fact that you, know, you have a support system, you have experts and, and all that, and you know, shrooms. So, so speaking of plants, uh, <laughs> so there's a, there's a notion in the book of tending your garden. Oh, I like that segue. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so let's talk about that. So what does that mean? Yeah, so um, uh, during the processing of and writing the book and um, so, you know, the processing of Tony's passing, I came to this point where realizing that, you know, us as leaders, we have a tendency to want to help grow our company, you know, our business, our profits. We're always trying to help others grow. Um, but in this processing, I realized the missing piece was that we're trying to nurture everyone else, but we forget about ourselves. So the whole metaphor or analogy is make sure you nurture your greenhouse as you're growing others. And I found that um, be, to be pretty timely, you know, when I have these conversations and it kind of a light bulb com comes on because especially right now, the 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 super leaders right now are just giving everything, you know, they're giving everything to their startup, they're giving everything to their family. And that's when we see things like, um, you know, unfortunate things that happen if we don't have that sort of psychological stability and safety within ourselves and the people we surround ourselves. So I think that's just a big learning. It sounds easy to do, you know, it's like the whole oxygen mask thing and the plane put it on first, but I think we forget because we're not flying as much anymore. So it's like a constant, constant reminder. And by doing the deep dive work into ourselves and also allowing and giving encouragement for our people to do it too, that's when you have a bit more visibility and clarity as to what you need for yourself to nurture your greenhouse. It's a really hard thing. You just said, you know, when you're in it, it's when you're, you can think about it all you want, but when you're in it, it often feels, I, I think about this all the time because I'm a parent now and I do go on planes and I think about what would I do when this situation always runs through your mind. And there's something innately that just feels like so selfish, right? Like you just need to take care of the others first. But when you do that, you can lose so much of yourself. It's so counterintuitive, totally. I mean, it's a like, perfect example. Of course you want to save your child, but then um, that ability to actually be more, again, intentional with our time, intentional with how we spend it, and realizing that I think we can all probably think of a moment in time or experience when we did intend to our greenhouse, focus too much on the other stuff, and then in the end, um, you know, kind of bit us in the butt. So just a big reminder. So, 
for our startups here, what are some sort of tactical things they can start to think about? So for those who maybe haven't had a chance to start implementing anything like this uh, within their environment, even if it's just you know, a team of a couple people, what are some things that they can do to be intentional about this process? Yeah, totally. So I would say, um, especially because of this moment and where we are right now, where we're still like, we thought we saw, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. No, it's not there yet. Oh, we thought we saw it again, but no, it's not there yet. So I think people are just still in this state of major flux. So I think tactically speaking, even if you have purpose and values, I would revisit them because uh, the majority of the people I've been talking to have already shifted. Maybe not like gone, uh, deleted them or taken some away, but actually reprioritize them for today and adapt to them. The other tactical thing that we've been doing that's been showing um, really great results for connectedness, uh, especially in Zoomland, is to have these exercises done with everyone on your teams. So everyone is actually inputting, identifying their own personal values, their own personal purpose. And when you do that sincerely, then they can tell. Like they all of a sudden, oh, you actually care about me as a person wholly, you know, not just for the skills and how they kick ass and whatever they're doing, but mentally, emotional, relationally, physically, spiritually, or purposefully. When you have those kind of conversations and you have people share, you see really cool moments and you see how I mean, they realize how much more alike and similar they are than different. And so all the divisiveness of like what's been going on in the world kind of goes away because all of a sudden you're talking about more meaningful things um, aside from, you know, bet, you know, what you're binging on Netflix or your half hour drink. I mean, those are important topics, but those don't really touch, kind of touch to the core, you know, of making people feel seen and heard, especially when we're in a disconnected society. So we, we're about at time. I wanted to finish with what do you do as a leader to tend to yourself? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I'm actually still trying spot. to figure it out. I, I really, uh, I really am not, I'm half joking on that one because as I wrote the book, um, it brought out a lot of stuff in terms of identifying what it is that really, I mean, it's really clear what hit, you know, I get high on. <laughs> literally and figuratively there yeah <laughs> whatever you want to make out of that um but understanding those lows understanding my dad's passing like 18 years ago understanding tony's passing uh it has it's it's a journey and i mean we're still in the thick of a lot of different things right now so i'm i'm still discovering it for myself but recently i i bought an e-bike so <laughs> trying to get outside more often and, uh, and yeah, just reinstilling my, my, my personal values of being people with people I love. Thank you for taking the time today. We yeah, appreciate you, for you being me. here. Thank you, everyone. And don't forget, we've got some books right over there. We would love for you to have a copy. And thank you to Delivering Happiness for these complimentary books for all of you. Please take one home, read it, think about how you can take some steps to build these things, these things into your company. Again, for you for your employees and your growth, and also just for yourself and how you can keep yourself in a great place throughout your journey. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jay.